Darn it. Hey, we're finishing up talking about comebacks. We started three weeks ago talking about it. And um, what do you think gets in the way of a comeback? Thoughts? Villains. A sophomore, Villains? A sophomore slump. A sophomore slump? Okay. I honestly thought that was a shot against Bates for a second, but okay. Someone who wants to smack your neck. I feel like these are very specific things here. A setback. A setback, okay. You... You can make a turnaround on something, and we talked about last week a little bit, um, about kind of what causes us to get there. And so we're going to kind of look at, kind of like center around this question of, like we get this kind of like, man, after what I did, there's no way I could turn it around. Like, I think I'm too far gone. And so uh, we're going to get to that, but we kind of like just to recap, week one we talked about, hey, every comeback we have is possible because Jesus, Jesus come back from death, defeating sin and death sets up the stage for us to come back from anything with his power in us. Um, then we talked about, hey, we looked at the life of Matthew, like, okay, if I can come, come back, what does it take? And there's this waiting invitation of Jesus that he's offered, and it's there, and it's waiting, and it's up to you what you do with it. And then last week we talked about, okay, in order for me to accept that invitation, what has to happen? We looked at the life of the prodigal son and looked at, hey, I have to come to a point to where I realize everything in my life needs to change because it's not working the way that I have been doing it. And just that, this idea that I almost have to realize I'm at rock bottom, even if I don't feel like it, in order to turn things around. And so we're going to look, like today, the, 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 the big idea like today, and the question we want to answer is, okay, when I want to have this comeback, what actually has to happen? Right? I realize, okay, I'm at rock bottom. I realize I'm going to accept this invitation. Now what? Right? In the Wizard of Oz, I click my heels together, but that's not what we do, right? Has anyone seen that? It's a pretty old movie. I hate it. I don't like, I think it's this, I don't know. It's one of the stupidest things in the world. Yeah, sorry if you like it. But anyway, right? What do we do? Like, what do you do once I want to turn it around? And so this is the big idea, right? My comeback begins in the restoration of community and relationship, and it culminates, that's a fancy word for ends or is like fulfilled, in the restoration of purpose, right? So that's kind of fancy language. But basically, hey, my comeback begins when I'm restored to community and relationship, and it ends when my purpose is restored. So we're going to look um, at the very end of the book of John, John 21, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be looking at this and kind of in the life of Peter and kind of see, okay, what, what happened in the life of Peter? So here's a little bit of background, right? Peter, one of the like, disciples, Jesus has called him. He was a fisherman. When he called him, said, hey, come follow me. And he said, sweet, I don't want to be a fisherman anymore. I want to follow you. So he goes and follows him. And he's with Jesus for his three, three and a half years of ministry. And he's with him until the very end, right? The last supper, they're gathered in the upper room and he's passing out like the bread. And he says, hey, one of you is going to, uh, to like betray me. And Peter's like, no, it's never going to be me. And Jesus says, actually, it's going to be you, right? And he says, no, there's no way. So they go to the garden. And in the garden, Judas is the one that has set him up, right? And Peter's like, oh man, I am on Jesus' side. I'm going to hack the ear off of this like, soldier that has come to uh, get him. Why? He probably missed. He was probably going for a bigger blow and missed and just got the ear. But either way, right, cuts the ears off. Jesus puts the ear back on, kind of a weird like, miracle type thing there, and says, Peter, put away your sword. Peter's like, what the heck? And they, they arrest Jesus, take him off. Peter follows. He's being put on trial. And Peter's kind of hiding in the background, kind of see what happens. And this little girl says, hey, aren't you one of his like, disciples? He says, no, I don't know him. All right? And he denies him once, and then he denies him again to another person, and then again, right? And just like Jesus said, hey, you may not like, betray me, but you will deny me three times. He, he has like, denied him, and he says, hey, and he realizes, right, this, this rooster crows, and he's like, man, I, I did exactly what he said, and he runs and he flees, and we don't hear anything of Peter. And then Jesus is taken, and he's beaten, and he's put on the cross, and he dies, and three days later he rises from the dead, and Peter's still nowhere to be seen. And then Jesus appears to his disciples. And then we have this story in John chapter 21. It's kind of a, just a random thing at the very end. It's just almost seen as another, hey, he's just proving that he is still, that he has come alive, that he's not dead anymore. Kind of just, hey, he's, he is now being seen again. But there's a lot more to it. And we're going to look at that um, as we walk through and kind of look at, okay, what happens when I come back? Because if anyone is in need of a comeback, it's Peter, All right? He was on Jesus' side, close to him, and he denied him and bailed on him at the last minute. If you had a friend that did that to you, they probably wouldn't be a friend. All right? And so we are going to look at that. So that's John chapter 21 is the very start. Jesus shows up. 
verses 1 through 8, basically the, uh, the paraphrase of this. Jesus shows up. Peter and the guys are out fishing. He's going back to his old life. He's fishing, and he's fishing overnight. They don't catch anything. This has happened uh, before. Jesus from the shore, they don't, like, no, it's him. He says, hey, cast your nuts on the other side. And they do, and they catch a bunch of fish, and they come in. And they come in, and then they realize it is Jesus. And we're going to pick up in verse 8 as we talk about kind of what is going on here. So verse 8, actually, let's just do verse 9, okay? It says, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in, in place. See, Jesus didn't cook with propane, okay? Keep that in mind. All right? They didn't have it then, but it's whatever. With fish laid out on it and bread. So he's making breakfast, right? Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. That's a good day fishing, right? 153 big fish. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. All right, so you have Peter. Again, it's, Jesus says, come have breakfast. What's the big deal? This is a guy that had denied him. And now he's face to face with Jesus. He sees the holes in his hands. He sees where the flesh has been torn from him, and he knows and is reminded of what he did. And so this is the first thing we see is Jesus is inviting him back into community. He said, hey, come be a part of the family, right? You're still part of my group. You're still part of my family. Why? Because he loves him, right? And he's basically saying, hey, right? If you're Peter, you're sitting there like, okay, he's going to tell me to leave. He's going to just give me a dirty look. not even like acknowledge me. He looks at him and says, you hungry? You want some breakfast? Right? There's a reason, church people, everything we do, there's food involved, right? Jesus did it, right? So, but, but there's something about sharing a meal with someone that is, brings you like, together, right? And there's that like, community aspect of, hey, we are like, together, and this is what you do with your family. It's a family meal. And so when Jesus is doing this, he's saying, hey, let's have breakfast together. The family's getting like, together. Come on and sit down. He's inviting him back into that. That's a big deal, right? Peter had left, and he had just abandoned him, and Jesus' response was not only does he invite him, but he goes to where Peter's at, right? Jesus knows where he's at. He knows he's out fishing. He's gone back to who he was, and he goes back to where he found him the first time. He says, you want some breakfast? Want to make a muffin? I don't know if they had McMuffins. Maybe that's the bread he had, right? Yeah. I was, it's probably a bacon and cheese McGriddle, but who knows, Right? Or the filet of fish could be. I don't, we're just on McDonald's menu now. They had fish. Anyway, let's move on, right? So food is a great door to like community. So Jesus invites him in and says, hey, let's have breakfast together. That's what family does. Peter knew that it was Jesus, and he's feeling the shame and this regret and everything that goes along with betraying and abandoning somebody in their darkest hour. And he's feeling it, and he knows it, and he sees Jesus. And he's not getting this, like, what are you doing here? He's getting a, come have a seat. Let's eat together. Right? Jesus brings them back in. And then they're sitting around and Jesus is passing this, this bread out. And think back to the last meal that Peter had with Jesus in the upper room, sitting around a table, Jesus passing out the bread. That's coming back into his mind. And when he swore that he would stand by and that he would never like, betray him, that he would never turn his back on him. All right? There's got to be a pit in his stomach as he's dealing with this. But Jesus will say, hey, you're my family. Let's have breakfast together. Right? And there's this awkward point, right? It's, it's, it's really awkward when you have betrayed someone, when you have abandoned them, when you've turned your back on them, and then you see them again for the first time. That's really awkward. Anyone ever been there or have a friend that's been there? Yeah. yeah, okay, right? It's awkward. And what's even more awkward is that moment where now we're going to deal with this. Now we're going to hash this out. All right? And it's awkward, but for restoration to occur, the issue needs to be it, to be addressed. And that's what we jump to next, right? So we have this, hey, come have breakfast. Jesus says, hey, you're part of the family, let's have breakfast. But as part of the family, sometimes we have to deal with some stuff. All right, so we have this first, my comeback begins in the restoration of, com- of community. Okay, he's part of it. We got that. But the next part is my comeback continues in the restoration of relationship. That's a little bit more messy. Verse 14, all right? Let's jump ahead to 15. 14, just an ender. Right? When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Right? So this is kind of a weird interaction here. Right? And I find myself having this conversation with my kids a lot. Not this one exactly. Like, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Dad, you don't have sheep. Right? <laughs> like, but there's a question of why did you do that? I don't know. I, I hate that answer. Right? You know why you did it. Right? Well, I don't know. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? And this continual going over it to help them understand. And so that's a little bit of what Jesus is doing here. This, I need you to understand this. But again, in order to understand this, we have to understand what happened. Jesus said, you will deny me three times. And then Peter denies him three times. So we have this. He has denied him three times. And then Jesus at breakfast, well, after breakfast, is sitting there with him and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. There it is. Right? And so we have this kind of moment to where what is happening, right? Peter's a denial destroyed the relationship. Peter was the one that ruined it, right? A reminder for us that our sin, our blood betrayal, is what wrecks the relationship with God, right? It's on us, not on him. Jesus shows up where we, where he knows we are at and says, okay, what are you going to do about this, all right? But his actions didn't show love, right? If I love someone, I don't abandon them. I stand with them. I don't, I deny them. But what we see here is Jesus is giving him another chance. He's allowing that restoration to happen, right? That is the big thing what we're talking about here is a, a comeback leads to restoration. But they have to deal with, hey, you've done this thing. Jesus isn't just looking past it. We have to deal with this. We have to get on the same page here. And so Peter basically said, I don't love him. I don't love him. I don't love him with his actions. And so Jesus is sitting there and says, do you love me? Like, I need to hear it from you. Do you love me? Yeah. Then this is what you should do. Do you love me? Yes. Then this is what you should do. Do you love me? And it says that Peter was grieved. Why? Because he knew. He had, he had I'm sure, been, been thinking about that and replaying it in his mind over and over and over again what he did, wishing he could take it back, wishing he could have done it differently, knowing what he should have done, wishing that he had been willing to lay down his life, but he wasn't. And when Jesus says this, it is cutting him to the core, but Jesus is also saying, we had breakfast. I just want to know if you love me. Not that you betray me, but do you love me? And he's giving him this opportunity. He's giving him this chance that he didn't have. And he's not saying, well, if you love me, you shouldn't have done this. He says, okay, if you love me, then going forward, this is what we do. I think we really need to look at that as someone who may have been wronged, we don't do the, well, if you love me, you wouldn't have done this. It's, if you love me, then going forward, this is what happens. We don't hold grudges. If the perfect God of the universe doesn't hold a grudge against someone that betrayed him, what right do you have? What right do I have? We don't. Yeah, right? Sin or Holding a grudge is sin. Nailed it. All right, so here we go. So after the third time, right? So finally it says, okay, Peter's grieved. He's asked this third time, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And that's done. But the thing is, is Jesus didn't overlook it. And like, it is finished. It's not brought up again, but it's like, it, it is done and it's not needing to be dealt with because it was handled well before Peter said the third time that I love you. It was handled when Jesus was on the cross right after he had abandoned him and said, hey, I have taken the sins of the world upon myself, including what Peter just did to me. And I've paid for it. And it's done. And it is finished. It's over with. Jesus had already taken care of it, but what Peter needed to know was that was not being held against him. You may be thinking, man, I need to come back from something, but I've gone so far. But this past month, this past year, whatever it is, like this past week, this past... You're 18 these past 17 years. I don't know if you did something horrible as a one-year-old, right? Like, whatever you're trying to come back from, you maybe have in your mind, yeah, but this was really bad. Yeah, but this was a big deal. God would never let that go. And what we see here in the life of Peter is it was finished before Peter even knew it because it was paid for on the cross. What Peter needed to know, what I needed to know was Jesus is not holding that against me. The relationship has been restored. 
He has brought me into his family to restore the, co the community. He's restored the relationship by forgiving me and paying the debt for my sin. And then we move on to the next part of once those things are taken care of, I can be restored to my purpose in life. All right? But we have to know that Jesus won't hold my sin against me because him and Peter are good. All right? That should be really good news for people like us. I don't know if you're like me, but you've done some things in your life that you're not proud of, you're ashamed of, you don't want anyone in this room to know about. And you can have this thought of like, Jesus is going to hold this against me. No. He says the same thing to you that he said to Peter. You're not new, you when you're hungry. Right? Sit down and eat. Let's hash this out. Know that I've paid for it. <laughs> so... The relationship's been restored. Now Peter can do what he was created for. So what happens next, right? You jump ahead. This is one of the weirdest verses in the Bible to me. Verse 18. Truly, truly, I... So he says, hey, feed, feed my sheep. Continue down with the next breath. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Mm. Huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, All right, let me eat. Okay, you forgive me. Thank you. I used to dress myself, but someone else is going to dress me now. Like, I meant something here, right? But then he's, hey, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. All right? Think about that. He's saying, hey, you are, you are going to live a long life. Not every like, disciple was like, guaranteed that. A lot were hung, martyred, killed. He's saying, you're going to live this long life to glorify me. He's been restored to his purpose. Right? And he's been brought back. But then he says this, and after saying this, he said to him, follow me. It goes back to the very thing he said to him the first day he met him. Peter was, I think, probably had a fantastic beard. That's just in my mind. I don't know for sure but it had to be awesome. He's super manly, right? He's a fisherman, kind of like one of those guys from Deadliest Catch, right? And so it's just in my head. It may not be true, but that's why I picture him. You can too, okay? And so, but he's this manly guy on his boat, and Jesus is this guy just walking along the beach and says, come follow me, and he drops everything, leaves his business, leaves everything, and goes to follow him. And goes through these three and a half years, sees him do these amazing things, turns on him at the very end, is running in like disgrace, and has gone back to his old life to be a fisherman, to do what he used to do, because you can't come back from that. You can't come back from that. And then Jesus shows up where he was at. Shows back up in his life. Says, hey, let's fix this issue. You're still part of my family. The relationship's been fixed by what I did on the cross. But more than anything, I have a question for you. It's the same question I asked you to start with, and, I, and, and you had the same chance to answer. Nothing's changed in our, in our love relationship because of what you did. Follow me. Glorify me with your life. Make your life about me and my kingdom. And you say, man, that guy's been, he, he did a pretty awful thing to Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, st still do this. That's good news for you and me. That we can come back from whatever has happened in our life and still live the life he created us for. There's nothing that puts you too far, nothing that is too bad, nothing that you've done for too long that, you, that he cannot say, I've paid for it on the cross. What I need to know now is will you follow me? Will you live the life and walk with me the way I intended you from the moment you were born? knowing everything you do, knowing every sin you never do, and I still love you, I still died for you, will you follow me? He reminds Peter of his purpose. Peter had gone back to his old life, to what he was before Jesus, and Jesus reminds him of this. You're not a fisherman. That may be what you do, but you're not a fisherman. You're a shepherd now. Why? Tend my sheep, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. Over and over again, he's saying, this is who you are. This is your job. This is your role. This is your life. Don't you settle for who you were before me. I'm pretty sure sheep here is symbolic. <laughs> Nailed it. Sheep are symbolic of all right, his flock. So we'll get to that a different time. Okay? So bad choices do not erase the effect that Jesus has on your life. 
you screwing up doesn't like dilute Jesus. You ever make Kool-Aid? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Big Kool-Aid fan. Right? There's a certain mixture. <laughs> There's a certain mixture that's about perfect. Right? But you can also have that, okay, I've got, I put too much water in, and then what do you have to do? Thank you. There's some people who just dump it out. Don't you waste that. You're just making two gallons instead of one gallon now, right? So you add more. And it's just, it's not, hey, man, I did a lot of bad stuff. I have to add, add more of God. I have to add more of like Jesus into my life. No, it's, I've done a lot of bad, but Jesus is saying, I will make it the perfect amount. And I will be the perfect thing that is needed. There's not too much bad that you can do. Now, it's not, hey, do whatever you want. He's saying, I have paid for it on the cross. You live your life in a way that says, I want to glorify God, not live for myself. You're going to make mistakes along the way, yeah. But he's saying, do not go back to being a fisherman when you're always meant to be a shepherd. When you screw up, don't retreat to who you were before Jesus. Go to breakfast with him. And there's a lot of times where we, in shame and in pride, we screw up, we make a mistake, we do something for maybe a long time. And we say, well, man, I, I'm kind of, I can't come back from that. When what we really need to do instead of running from God is show up at, at breakfast, stare him in the eye awkwardly, have, have that moment where we feel our shame and guilt, and he says, you hungry? Let's eat and talk about what I've already taken care of so you know you're forgiven, so you can get back to the purpose you live for. Put aside your pride and embrace restoration. You may be here tonight and you say, hey, I've never started a relationship with Jesus. That's the first comeback that needs to happen in your life. But here's the thing, you're going to have comeback after comeback that needs to happen over and over and over again. You, you may be here and you've been a Christian since you were five years old and you got baptized before you could read. I don't know. You may need to come back from something. There's something that you've gone and you've walked away from him. You maybe had a Peter sort of moment to where you were just ashamed and you did your own thing, and hey, no, I'm not going to live that way. Or you may have been involved in something that is just taking you far from him. And the invitation is still there that we talked about. You have to realize if you've hit that bottom that we talked about last week with the prodigal, and then, right, allow the restoration to happen. Why? Because Jesus wants you back in the community. Jesus wants to fix the relationship that you broke. And he wants to restore you to your purpose. Now you may be here and you're saying, hey, man, I, I just don't feel like I'm doing well with God. Well, have you showed up to breakfast? Some of those conversations you've had at the dinner table with your family, but when I remember, I was in fifth or sixth grade, and I just I was in trouble a lot. Like, stupid stuff. Yeah. Like, hey, note home. We had gray slips. I don't know why. Like, it was called a gray slip. It's like a detention, right? But it was a gray slip. It was called it was like, oh, gray slip. You take that home, slide it across the table. And a lot of times you're like, okay, I'm going to try to justify this. But there were some that were like, slide across the table. Mom and dad are like, and why did you throw a whole roll of toilet paper over the stall? <laughs> well, it was like this, right? Here's how this was necessary. I didn't know if Craig on the other end needed another role. I was trying to know. Like it was, I was being stupid, right? A lot of things like that. And it was always that there's that awkward time. Mom's making dinner. Dad's still at work. I'm playing in the basement far away from any like adult eyes to feel the shame and judgment and wrath from. And then it's, it's, it is time to eat. And you come to the table. It's time to eat. Turner's hungry. He's, he smells some donut holes, doesn't he? Yeah. And you come to the table, and when you get to the table, the community of your family has come together, and with that, there's the, hey, there's some stuff we have to take care of. When I was in fifth and sixth grade, it was, hey, you're doing stupid things at school. When I was a freshman in high school, I'd say, hey, one of the things you should be doing, your homework and doing well on tests, is not happening at school, right? And there's always something that you dealt with at the table. And it was awkward. And it's sometimes you don't want to look in the eye, you don't want to deal with it, but it's always better for you. Because you know that the person that is calling you out and saying, hey, this is an issue, loves you and cares about you. 
and you deal with that so you can get on to what you're meant for. And some of you guys are stagnant and hanging out. You're just sitting on the beach like Peter, and you're not willing to walk up to breakfast. And, and in order for you to live out the purpose God has for you, you have to take that step to that. It may be an awkward like, conversation that's coming. It may be one of those things you are spending some time with God, and he's going to convict you of some stuff in your life. But we have to have that before we get back to our purpose. Because your purpose comes in the relationship you have with him. So the question would be, do you have a relationship with him? And if there's something that needs to be fixed, something you need to come back from, are you willing to show up to breakfast with Jesus? To look him in the eye, deal with the stuff that needs to be dealt with, and be restored. See, it's not for him, it's for you. When you spend time in God's word, it's not for him. He already knows what he said, right? It is for you to know what he said, to know what he wants for you, to correct the things that need to be like corrected, to push you and launch you to your purpose. Where are you at? Answer that for yourselves. You want to talk to someone, grab someone. You're going to grab some donut holes and then grab a person and say, hey, I already have like donut holes. I need to go to breakfast with Jesus. Help me with that. All right? And tomorrow morning when you wake up and you grab your breakfast or Pop-Tart or whatever suffices as breakfast these days, you think about that. What is holding you back from what Jesus has, has called you to? Or have you gone to breakfast with him, been restored to community, relationship, and your purpose? And if not, then you're going to be wanting and longing for something. Just show up. 